I, I came into the realization that as someone from the Caribbean, I was being automatically overlooked on the basis that people see us as small, um, in many instances poor um, territories, and the only real value we offer to the world is nice beaches, right? Through my life experience, you know, I had just seen so many instances where when people were able to meet in the right environment, yeah. not only was a lot of value unlocked, but you know, there's, there's a level of understanding that can be gained, right? Which is why in the business world, people, you know, as, as inefficient as sometimes people think it is, there's also the side where people just always want to meet, right? Mm. Because we, we are beings that thrive on connectivity. Um, some people try to remove Mm-hmm. remove it for whatever reason because mm-hmm. they think that it, they, we can be more efficient but we thrive on connectivity and we thrive on relationships mm-hmm. so the important thing is just to start where you are and I think a lot of people try to start at the end instead of the beginning mm-hmm. focus on ensuring that you understand what the beginning of what you're trying to achieve looks like and work on those parts mm-hmm. don't try to be what you know you know your dream is 10 years from now Focus on where you are. All right, great. So I'm so happy to have Kirk here. Uh, Kirk and I actually met in 2016 in Davos, of all places, at the World Economic Forum annual meeting. And we're here today in Bermuda to uh, listen to him and learn about all the things he's done and how he did it. So welcome, Kirk, um, to the School of Social Justice. Uh, tell us a bit about yourself. What's your story? Well, firstly, thank you for having me. Um, definitely good to good to reconnect in somewhere like Bermuda of all places, uh, the the Switzerland of the islands, I think. So mm-hmm. Davos to, to Bermuda makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. Um, my story, in the in the simplest sense, to try to be brief, I am a Jamaican-born son of the Caribbean. Uh, my family made a move from Jamaica to Barbados when I was about twelve. It's a very unusual move for Caribbean people to move within the region. Typically, okay. outside of university, we tend to move to places like the US, Canada, or the UK. Mm-hmm. But moving to Barbados really gave me a different perspective and opened up my eyes to the both challenges and opportunities that the, that the region um, presented. I was only 13 years old, so okay. you know my, my vision certainly wasn't articulated back then, but what I... What I realized through that experience was the differences between all our islands, even though a lot of times we tend to get classed as one. Mm. And, you know, the, the missing kind of pieces that each island could add in terms of value to other islands, mm. right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, in my more mature years, um, I started on a journey to work to really attract resources into the region. Why was and that needed? It was... You know, why, why wasn't that already happening? Um, well, how to put it? I mean, we are a post-colonial society. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not to say that international resources don't already look at the Caribbean or um, end up here, right? But if you think about markets like where you're from, you know, yeah. the US, etc., despite the challenges, there's a level of abundance that we don't experience, right? Okay. And so I guess for me it was how do you open up the channels to attract even more than what was there. But most importantly, what I wanted to see was a shift in the relationship between our islands and and these resources coming in. That's fascinating, because I mean, so many of uh, the folk who watch um, will most likely be involved in local efforts Mm -hmm. where you might be in a big city like London and there might be a poor part and they're trying to get resources from local and central government. Um, You might have regions, but like, how does it work when you've got a whole world of resources and some are a bit more concentrated in other parts of the world as you say in the west in um, northern europe how do you make the case for more investment in places which haven't had as much investment um so a couple points one is what i really wanted to shift was the exploitive nature of you know resources coming in um as you know these things still happen but as i saw it back then where how are they exploited? uh just you know at the end of the day um people and organizations with capital coming into markets that lack capital and being able to, you know, set up shop, um, 
build their empires but then extract those resources back home or extract that capital back to where they're from right so so it doesn't stay here exactly it's been taken away in a different means yes that would that's what you'd end up with Mm. and so you know islands like where i'm from jamaica um especially have have seen this over and over you know um there are some gems in our tourism industry but at the same time there are a lot of these um you know hotel projects in our market that export revenue right okay. that's 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 all they end up doing mm. and so um you know my my mission was really to try to create a different kind of ecosystem and a different kind of interaction where people would come into the market and engage with local stakeholders and potential partners mm-hmm. right in in many ways right in some instances mm-hmm. you know i i want to see caribbean people put up capital into projects yeah. um but i also want to see them be able to contribute their talent um, and, and their networks and their other resources as well, mm-hmm. right? So it's not a one-sided game. And what I found was, or what I felt was happening was that when people want to look at the region, yeah. they typically enter only through government, right? Okay. Now, I don't think that's a fault of the government, but at the end of the day, you know, the, the, the reality being what I wanted to see was just greater interaction and a more level playing field. Mm. So I set out to try to create that right mm. try to how create. does one do that so how, how you, you saw the problem <laughs> i mean how do you that's a huge problem yeah so what did you do what was the day you realized i'm going to do this and how what was your plan yeah so so the big thing is you, you won't solve the entire problem at once right so i'm not nearly um i'm not nearly complete with this journey for mm-hmm. myself nor is the caribbean nearly complete with with its journey in this space mm. but um you know how, how do you do it? I, in hindsight, it's a little bit difficult to try and you know, piece all the, the, the things together. But mm. my story is, is one of a certain level of risk um, okay. and reward. Yeah. So the way I started out was I approached a hotel in Jamaica mm-hmm. called GoldenEye. You Gold- just picked up the phone you, or you just emailed them and you were like, let's meet not quite email them i i reached out to someone who knew them but i have to give you the dynamic of this place yeah, right yeah. so golden eye um is where ian fleming wrote all the james bond novels wow. it is a property that james bond then i mean bob marley then bought from ian fleming wow. and then chris blackwell who's bob marley's former manager slash u2's former manager um found, founder of island records then bought and mm. chris decided to turn it into a resort Wow. So okay. it's a barefoot luxury resort in Jamaica, very luxurious, very historic um, significance. Yeah, yeah, historic significance, well placed, very nice. So I saw an opportunity mm. to use a kind of anchor of Jamaican history, um, but something with a very global profile yeah. to, to start to tell a story. Okay. But the story I was trying to tell yeah, was yeah. quite interesting. So what I wanted to do was actually host a party, right? I, okay. I approached GoldenEye on the basis of, look, I would like to invite all these people to Jamaica and I want to have this entertainment event because mm-hmm. that's the kind of stuff I knew back that's then. The world, yeah. um, I wanted to have an entertainment event where local people of ilk could meet foreign people of ilk because I yeah. found that those two groups weren't meeting and mm. I wanted to start there and then be able to have a, Why was that a trickle. Well, you know, if you... I kind of thought about things the way um, Tesla has approached transforming okay. energy, right? It's like you go after the the best resourced individuals first because they mm. they have the um, they're able to kind of tolerate yeah. the evolution of what you're trying to do, right? Because they have the resources to to, to spend in that way, yeah. um, and and they have the resources to be patient, mm. right? Um, so you you start there. And then after you are able to establish what it is you're trying to achieve, then you can start to reach all the other tiers, right? Right. So we haven't quite reached to the depths of where we want to get to yet, but we certainly come down the spectrum from, you know, the most established people in the world slash Caribbean Mm -hmm. into, you know, trying to benefit startups and people who come from diverse economic backgrounds. Um, Our, where we've gotten to so far is really people who, come from diverse economic backgrounds, but are trying to build ideas that can be transformative, right? So, and, and how do you think this relates to social justice? So, you know, tourism, someone would be like, what does tourism have to do with this? What does foreign investment have to do with social yeah. justice? And, and the concept of social justice being 
you know, a place where society and where, where, where there's fairness mm -hmm. and, and fairness happens. Um, do you have any thoughts on sort of why tourism uh, and foreign investment and this intermingling between, you know, people from abroad and locals is important? Yes. So in all of this, I want to get back to your question as well as to how we attracted some of the resources. Mm -hmm. But um, on the end of the Caribbean, right, we we have been the not beneficiaries. We we have faced decades slash maybe centuries of mass extraction, right? In slavery. terms of value, slavery and you know post-colonial industries that have, like I mentioned earlier, taken a lot of resources from the region. So what unlike, that, what, how did that make you feel knowing that that was your history? Um, well, it certainly affected me in the sense of what I'm trying to now achieve for myself and others is the creation of a more level playing field, right? Because as a, you know, I, I came into the realization that as someone from the Caribbean, I was being automatically overlooked on the basis that people see us as small, um, in many instances, poor um, territories. And the only real value we offer to the world is nice beaches, right? So imagine, you know, you're, you think you can change the world as an individual, but the profile that you carry when someone picks up the phone is you're talking to somebody from Jamaica or you're talking to somebody from Barbados and the immediate message that sends to the other guy mm -hmm. on the other side of the line who, you know, almost automatically doesn't take it serious anymore, right? So it's interesting because like in the Western context, in the UK context, mm -hmm. often it's based on class, the way you speak, the way you hold yourself, the way you dress, yes. or on race and ethnicity. But what you're trying to say is this is country, what, this is about the country you're from oh, yeah. and the place you're in. Well, because I guess if you're a Brit, there are many privileges that come with having exactly. a British citizenship. But you're saying by being Jamaican, yes. you are seen therefore in the world as in a particular way yeah. and judging that way. Definitely. Okay. So what I would say to that is, you know, for places like the UK, North America, um, maybe even parts of Asia, mm. wealth creation as a concept has become a luxury, right? It's like in, in some circles, it might even be taboo. So mm. you asked the question earlier, you know, how is this, how is something like that social justice for places that have not benefited from that over, you know, centuries or decades, these things, you know, the concept becomes new. And it's not that we don't have, like we have very well endowed individuals in the Caribbean. Um, what we've lacked is any broad spread opportunity for people to be able to kind of experience their own, you know, level of achievement in that regard, right? Um, certainly you have people who have ascended from poverty to Prosperity is, is a term you hear a lot in Jamaica. Uh, is that the sort of tale which is told? Yes. Sort of tales of those anecdotes and stories of people that show that you can make it too. Yes, you always you, you will always have those, right? And there are some, but I feel like they're they're too few and far between. Mm -hmm. And even though everyone's ambition is not to be in any way absurdly wealthy, mm -hmm. right? At the end of the day, I think the, the the big thing for me has always been: can Caribbean people reach a place where for the most part, I don't know if we'll ever achieve everyone, but for the most part, if you want something more for yourself, mm. the, the gateways can open up for you. Mm. And we're not quite there yet. Mm. I think we're more on our way than we were before. Mm. But the reality as to what I was kind of deciding to challenge is this idea that you're from this small place and therefore these, these openings are not accessible to you. You, you would mm -hmm. not be able to partake mm -hmm. in, in these kind of outcomes, right? I mean, it's so fascinating because, yeah. like, you know, as somebody who was born and raised in London um, to Filipino immigrants, um, you know, I'm here now with you in Bermuda, the most expensive country in the world. Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, with a, a box of strawberries is $20. Uh, and yet I've seen a whole bunch of, uh, a community of Filipinos mm -hmm. um, here uh, similar to my mum and dad and what they did, waiters, um, hotel staff, and it's just fascinating to me because I, I wouldn't have guessed it, it, but of course one of the biggest recipients of remittances in the world is the Philippines, so people coming here, earning money and sending back home. But what makes it fascinating for me is as a British Filipino being here, 
my opportunity is totally different to their opportunity simply because I was born and raised in England, but I'm also Filipino. Um, and I wonder like how that works in, in a place like Bermuda where there is some diversity. Uh, in Jamaica, I assume there's a bit more diversity. Um, but what, what, what is that like in terms of the, the ethnic mix? And, and do, do you see that um, playing out in, in across the Caribbean? Um, so firstly, Ber I think Bermuda sits in a kind of class on its own, okay. right? Um, this is an island that is associated with the Caribbean because of the nature of the island, right? I mean, okay. because it is an island is, yeah. is the best way to put it. Um, but it's, a, you know, British colony slash former British territory um, still has very strong ties to the UK. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, it's much closer to North America yeah. than it is to the UK. Right, mm -hmm. so they sit in this very interesting space when it comes to being defined. Mm -hmm. Right, but you know, as you've seen, if you look around, this is a pretty well polished place. Yeah, um, very pretty. With a with a lot of um, a fair amount of abundance. People here will tell you about the inequities that exist, and mm -hmm. and fair enough. You know, especially if you are from Bermuda. Um, black Bermudians face some challenges that others mm. may not, okay. right? Uh, but but this is a, a state that I feel like has figured out some of the components that I want to see more of in terms of just a certain level of... Um, the, the term may not be welfare, but the, the ability of the government to support their people yeah. in a meaningful way, that people yeah. can at least live uh, a decent life, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so in other Caribbean islands, you know, Jamaica's motto is out of many one people. So mm -hmm. we do have a very diverse, uh, diverse population base. Um, other islands, maybe not so much. Okay. Right. Um, we experienced a, a large influx of immigrants from India and also mm -hmm. China uh, okay. long ago. And then obviously there were the English roots yeah. and such yeah. like that. Um, so certainly do these things influence um, the, the outcomes of each island, I want to say without doubt. Okay. And in what ways? Well, when you're in a small place, mm -hmm. right, you you grow up kind of experiencing the challenges and knowing what the system looks like, right? Mm -hmm. So it's very hard for a lot of people to take an outside view yeah. to say, you know, this is how it is, but it, this doesn't work, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a better Fresh way to do it. Yeah. Exactly. So there's a lot of value in fresh perspective. So if you mm -hmm. think about North America, for example, the story always is that immigrants yeah. make up a large percentage of the entrepreneurial population, right? Because these are the people who come in and realize that, wait, something is missing here. I can fill that gap, mm. right? In, in a lot of small territories, unfortunately, we look at those things in a, in a more negative light than America, oh, so you know, it's not as the land of as opportunity. Much. Not as welcomed. Um, Partially and that's because kind of ironic of, because right now the, the rhetoric in America has been anti-immigrant. Yeah, of increasingly yeah, yeah. anti-immigrant. Um, and yes, it's it's a very awkward rhetoric for them to have given what America is is the, the true fabric of American um, industry mm -hmm. is heavily built on on immigrants. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying is for for islands, right? Um, you know, we've we've taken the hit. Mm -hmm. of immigration in the past as well right with, with all the extraction that i mentioned yeah, earlier yeah. but i think we can also benefit greatly from greater levels of integration mm -hmm. right that's the most important term in terms of what i'm thinking about okay. which is that when international minds come into the market yeah. they must mm -hmm. um and, and they should have a duty to almost mm -hmm. connect with locals and pursue opportunity with yeah local influence involved and, and local stakeholders, right? And, so it's and joint. Those, yes, it must be joint and those stakeholders must have a meaningful um, presence yeah. in the outcome of, of the business, right? Not just supporters, yeah. not just you know technical people, but mm -hmm. actual owners, equitable mm -hmm. owners in, in business. Right. That's what we're about. I mean for those of you who don't know, um, if you've never met Kurt before, uh, one of the things that you always know is that he is the most well connected man in this uh, region uh, and probably one of the most well connected persons in the world. Um, why why is bringing people together important? Why is that community important, the diversity? And 
why did you choose this as your route? You know, you started off saying in the hotel you, you wanted to do a big party. Now you're here connecting folk from around the world with um, people in Bermuda. Tell us a bit about that, that, that part of your life because it's a big part of who you are uh, and also why you think band is a route to kind of achieving social justice as well. Yeah, no, for sure. So um, may not have been the, the best in the world, but, you know, former Fed chairman, um, I think it was chairman, Alan Greenspan, yeah. said yeah. something that has always re resonated with me, which was economies are built on the meeting of people, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I think we've seen that in the pandemic now, right? The, the reality is that despite all the lockdowns and shutdowns last year slash some part of 2020, we mm -hmm. saw these astronomical rises in equity values and such like that that really didn't align with what was going on in the world mm -hmm. and now we're seeing the reality play out where those same equity values are crashing heavily and you're starting to see the true econ economic effects of what happens when people cannot connect and interact mm -hmm. right so to me i just felt like through my life experience you know i had just seen so many instances where when people were able to meet in the right environment yeah. not only was a lot of value unlocked but you know there's there's a level of understanding that can be gained right which is why in the business world people you know as as inefficient as sometimes people think it is there's also the side where people just always want to meet right mm -hmm. because we we are beings that thrive on connectivity um, some people try to remove mm -hmm. remove it for whatever reason because mm -hmm. they think that it, they, we can be more efficient but we thrive on connectivity and we thrive on relationships. So why, I mean, this idea of a meeting, it's so mm -hmm. simple. We have meetings all the time. If you're a professional, we have it regularly on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. What is so powerful about meeting? Um, hmm. that's, a, that's a good question. And yes, you're right. We do, you know, we meet every day, mm. right? Um, I think the, the powerful thing about, at least the way we do things, yeah. right? is a large focus on diversity across various threads, right? Okay. Um, geographic, mm. race, race mm. Um, gender, um, and, and also, you know, economic background and such like that, yeah, yeah. right? When you can create those kind of cross sections, mm. that's where you find opportunity, right? Okay. Um, the reality is that you know, in my space, in the community building space, we talk a lot about like-minded people, mm -hmm. right? Sometimes what ends up happening though is that we connect people not only on, on the basis of like mind, but you know, like everything, like pockets and all those different details. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what ends up happening is you struggle to really unlock opportunity. You hear a lot about talk shops and such like that. Yeah, yeah. The, the way we do things that others, you know, also um, have, have embodied is when you take a multi-stakeholder approach, you find that if you're having real diverse conversations, you unlock real opportunity because yeah. someone here is going to hear from Alvin, yeah. right, um, of, a, of a problem in the UK or the way that something happens in the UK or something that's missing from the immigrant population mm. in the UK or something of that nature. Mm -hmm. That helps to awaken ideas mm. that might benefit a place like this right? right and if Alvin is already solving these problems in the UK or vice versa yeah, yeah. right all of a sudden you have an opportunity yeah, yeah you know I I'll give you a very quick example yeah. of where I kind of um, grasp this this concept I studied architecture okay I never knew that so um, yeah. I graduated with a master's degree mm -hmm. in the height of the last financial crisis yeah. which meant there were no jobs mm -hmm. I moved to Miami and I was searching for a job and a great opportunity came up where there was an architect, the largest architecture conference in the world, the AIA conference. Mm -hmm. So I went mm -hmm. and this is 20,000 people gathered, all architecture firms, mm -hmm. and they're all having the same issue, mm -hmm. right? Everybody's looking at me, no matter how large a firm is, basically telling me how many people they're firing, the fact that they can't hire me, right? And how poor the outlook of the industry is. And I stood in this room slash rooms, yeah. just constantly thinking to myself, why in the midst of a crisis like this, mm. is there a room of nothing but architects mm -hmm. and not, you know, bankers and developers and, yeah. you know, um, various kinds of installers, etc. Yeah. Why aren't that, why isn't it that that group of people are meeting 
to see what they can do yeah, yeah. and solve each other's problems as opposed to a group of people who have the same issue, yeah. right? All have Narrow. one line of, of, of um, opportunity, which is to get contracts to design buildings, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Saying to each other, we're not getting contracts to design yeah, buildings. Yeah, yeah. Everybody is saying the same thing to yeah. each other. So that really hit me and mm -hmm. resonated with me in terms of you know, how business works. Okay. Um, in that moment, I feel like I, I learned so much and took away so much. And that's a big part of how I think about designing the spaces okay. that we have when, when we look to connect people. I mean, tell us a bit about that. So how do you actually do this? Like, very practically speaking, yes. you know, you see an opportunity to bring people together. Where do you start? What do you do? Do you write a list of people you want to bring? Do you speak to one person who's connected and you're like, who else do I need to speak to? Do you, you know what, what does the planning of building community look like yeah. particularly for people who want to be community builders like you yeah so um we're in a unique space um mm -hmm. in the in the caribbean so our strategy first of all is leveraging i tend to say leveraging existing tourism infrastructure okay right so our tourism model in the caribbean is very tends to be very disconnected uh, you know again bermuda has a better model i think that that, that a lot of islands can learn from mm -hmm. but we tend to kind of separate the tourists from the visitors, right? But the reality okay. is we have these brilliant hotels. Yeah. They're attractive to outsiders, right? Mm. But they're also attractive as meeting places and such to people who live mm. on, on these islands, right? So we use that as the, the intersection mm. to connect. Now, so you first find a space. Yes, you have okay. to find a space. Now, not everybody needs a luxury space. Yeah. What you need is a space that's attractive to people, right? Okay. So if, if you want to talk about coffee, mm -hmm. find the best coffee shop, sure. right? Now, it may not be the most expensive, mm -hmm. but you find the coffee shop that really embodies community in the best way, mm -hmm. right? And you Got go it. after that. So we, we went after the best properties, like I mentioned, the mm -hmm. Golden Eye, mm -hmm. that we knew were attractive to international people yes. and, um, and, and local people. And do you have any tips for people, like how do you search this? Is it Google? Is it having those connections where you just ask people you know, how, so, how do you find, not necessarily your locations or spaces, yeah. but how do you discover people, spaces, you know, experiences? Sure. So I think it starts with your own passion, right? Very yeah. likely, if you want to do something around building a community, mm -hmm. you already are familiar with spaces that are going to capture people who are like you, right? right? Um, so, so, you know, I, I don't know that that comes down to the Google search and, and such, but mm -hmm. what you then do, um, as I did, was you have to find yourself doing two things at the same time. One is a scattered approach of just trying to find people who fit what you're looking for and, you know, throw a net. Throw in the widest net you can imagine, yeah, yeah. right? And over time, that net scales and scales. Mm. Um, our, our work has become a lot simpler slash more credible okay. in the time that we've been able to build a wider net. So over um, time, you just build a network which increases and you, you exactly. deliver on what you're supposed yes. to do and you build a reputation. So now we can say to an island like Bermuda or Barbados or whichever other territory, look, you know, we're going to do this with you. This is the value that's going to be presented. We'll end up getting X number of people down to the island. They're of this mm. ilk, uh, this capacity. These are the different things that, they, that they're that they involved in, etc. And when they say yes to us, mm. we are able to move forward with them. Right. right? Um, How so do you win these pitches? You know, because like, there's a lot of folk who maybe have just gone out of university. They want to yeah. be an entrepreneur like you, yeah. or they're looking for the job like you did in 2008 in Miami. Like, how do you, you, you know, you're 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 able to tell a story. Yes. How did you learn how to tell stories? Um, and, and you know, do you have any tips for people who want to try and effectively sell? Yeah. You know, whether or not they're trying to uh, win over a, a grant from a foundation, or to win over a big donor or to win over a government contract. Yes, so one quick thing that I just wanted to add to the last part before was beyond casting the, the wide net, mm. then you have to make your connections to other influencers, right? Okay. People who, and influencers doesn't mean large social following mm. necessarily, right? It's people who carry a certain reputation, mm. credibility in the space that you're trying to affect. Mm. Again, the coffee example, it may be the best coffee maker in the market that you're in, mm. right? get that person slash persons bought in because they are most likely to have the ability mm -hmm. to translate a message in a very simple form mm -hmm. that will take you me anybody else who's not in that space yeah, yeah. months to years right oh, yeah. on the um 
on the part that you just asked, I guess, you know, my story is, is definitely one of, you know, entrepreneurship. Um, and I would say it's a story of blood, sweat and tears, right? These okay. things take time. So to any university graduate, I would say, you know, I am now successful on the basis of experience, right? You, you almost have to, to me, build your own story, mm. right? Um, so now I have a great story to tell, but I had to set out and build that story. When I was just getting started... You've got to have meat on the boat. Exactly. You've got to have the materials yeah. and you build that through you know, I, I've been telling people lately, um, as I reflect, one of my first experiences in, in what I did with GoldenEye, right, was standing in front of a group in Jamaica, mm -hmm. tourism stakeholders, responsible yeah. for promoting the island and, and such, who literally laughed me out of the room, right? Well, what happened? I presented this idea that I wanted to attract a certain kind of person and mm -hmm. this is the interactions that were going to happen, etc. Mm -hmm. and, and they literally, oh, you know, man. snickered at it and, and many said, you know, why would these people come to Jamaica and furthermore, why would they, you know, who, how are you going to do this? How are mm -hmm. you the so person? So question your ability. Exactly. Because, you know, the way some people think mm -hmm. would be, we haven't done this, clearly. It, I wouldn't have a pitch if they had, mm -hmm. right? So if we haven't done this, what makes you think that you're going to be able to achieve it? Yeah, right? yeah. And, and that's one of the challenges of, of our market, I would say, in some instances. And clearly people face this in, in every country. But the idea that I am not supposed to be so ambitious. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and I would say, I guess I was naive enough to be willing to be so ambitious because I didn't realize that something was supposed to be wrong with it. Got it. Right. The youthful naivety, which then makes you take a jump and risk at something and do something completely different from someone who said, exactly. I know how it's supposed and, to be done. And not realizing, you know, the beauty about naivety is you have no idea how hard what you're trying to do really is or is supposed to be. Mm. So you said if you out, did, you would you wouldn't. If you start. did, you would look on, you know, it's like, would I get up tomorrow and say that I'm going to build a, a space suit? Right? I probably wouldn't because when I think about it, I don't have the knowledge, right? Yeah, yeah. Now, if I met the right person based on what I do, mm. I might try to help them connect and do certain things if I really believed in the dream. Mm. But the reality just being Kirk Hamilton is not going to yeah. sit here and say, hey, Alvin, you know what I'm yeah. going to do next? Yeah. I'm going to build a space suit because yeah. I know the risks of it. I know the lack of knowledge, etc., that I have. Mm. And so I, I probably wouldn't pursue it. Mm. So that's the beauty of, 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 of the naivety that I entered with. I believed in a different... Jamaica and a different Caribbean and I didn't know what was truly preventing it nor what would come in my way to challenge my efforts right um, but in terms of the pitch you know you you reach a point where I guess a few things come together all at the same time mm -hmm. right your one once you're creating value you build a reputation and credibility mm -hmm. right um, one of the things that I've heard a lot about my story is the persistence that I've had mm -hmm. has been a huge win overall um, because it's almost natural mm. that people are going to doubt your ambitions or doubt your, doubt your credibility if you haven't built a track record, mm. right? That's, you know, there's 7 billion people on the planet. Mm -hmm. Why do you think you can do this? Why are you the best? And you have to build the story that tells someone why you're the guy right mm. or the girl mm. so taking that risk is the first huge one mm. once you start understanding what your value creation looks like mm -hmm. it becomes an easier and easier story to tell and you start being able to package what value looks like okay right um on the measure of someone paid me x for this mm. they wouldn't pay me y right mm -hmm. and and you start to learn where that value sits okay. um, and the last thing I would say you know you mentioned it I can't necessarily say how to do this mm. but um, one of the greatest skill sets the future generation will will have and need to have mm. is the ability to tell stories mm. right so that's something that I believe you learn over time I studied oh. architecture okay yeah well for me I studied architecture mm. um, I don't practice architecture but one thing I tell people I took away from my architecture school uh, and training was we had to do these critiques mm -hmm. right and they're very kind of um, somewhat intrusive right you're, you're okay. standing up in front of people mm -hmm. and you're having to present 
and then they tell you everything that's right or wrong with your project. Oftentimes, what's wrong? So peer to peer, yeah. sort of direct criticism. You know what the hell? And yes. Okay. But the how? term that we used often was constructive criticism, mm -hmm. right? So you're not trying to destroy someone. Yeah. You're trying to ensure that they are able to grow and evolve with the information that they've been given, right? So that that helped me a lot when I reflect in terms of my ability now to tell my story and, and kind of architect a vision when I'm speaking to people, Got right? Um, there's still people who don't get what we're doing, right? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. so it's never, you'll never get everybody. Yeah. But over time, you build an understanding of what is resonating with okay. people, you know? Okay. And when, that's just, only, you can only get that through experience. Through, only can get it through experience, because I can promise you, if I tried to sit in this interview now and tell you what I was doing back in 2014, mm. We, we wouldn't even be halfway to you understanding yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what I'm trying to achieve, it. right? So the, the, the story that I tell now looks very different than when I was starting out. But yeah. a big part of it, Alvin, is somewhat credibility, right? Mm. In the sense of, you know me, yeah, yeah. you have a sense of what I achieved yeah. uh, or have achieved. And so when you hear me telling you, you know, these are the things we've done. You that deliver. You, exactly, you've yeah, seen yeah. it. Yeah. Um, and, and so, but also just, critically, when things don't go well, yeah, it's also because th there's a lot of stories that we hear about the best stories, but mm -hmm. then it's also about how people pick themselves up. And mm -hmm. I think your point about persistence, as well as troubleshooting, um, that's really important. So, how do you pick yourself up? Yeah. Um, so, what are the what are the main things you've learnt um, as somebody who's tried to address the problem which you raised in the very beginning, which is around bringing people um, from around the world to uh, the, your home region, um, you know, what, what are the biggest challenges you faced or one big challenge and like what was the big experience and lesson that you, you've gained from that, whether it be like a deep scar from a traumatic thing that's happened mm -hmm. um, or some, you know, uh, something that you saw, we want to address this challenge uh, and this is how we got through it. Well, I'll just give the reminder to what I mentioned earlier in mm -hmm. terms of, you know, I guess on one end, local people not buying into the idea themselves of a better Jamaica or Caribbean, right? That, and that's a huge so challenge. So winning over naysayers. Yes. Winning people who don't believe. Win winning over naysayers, but from the ground, right? Mm. The other big challenge, you know, when I started doing this stuff, and it's, it's changed a lot in, in this time, um, especially the, the audience that we were targeting, right? The, the, the well-to-do around the world. Mm. Jamaica back then had a reputation that wasn't the best. Okay. Right? So if you didn't know Jamaica, yeah. you may not have wanted to go because of fear of safety and, mm. and certain other aspects, right? Mm. Jamaica was, you know, to me, as big a tourism destination as we are and, and had been, we also had this image of being this very gritty island, okay. right? Yeah. Um, I used to always be trying to talk to you know, publications like Vice and such because the, the, the Jamaica that they wanted to cover looked mm. so different than the Jamaica that I knew and was mm -hmm. trying to sell, mm -hmm. right? And it's just like, look. I say, uh, when I see like stories about the Philippines and yeah. that, you know, the microcosms of what is the worst parts of it, I mean, that is a new story, but it's not the real story. It's not the whole folk. story, right? Yeah. So they like to take their cameras into the, you know, the inner city areas, the worst parts of Jamaica and all that, which is great. I want mm. the, the full story to be told, mm. but what they don't, try to do is tell you about everything else that's yeah, happening yeah. right so we we were up against that so I always say to mm. people one indicator to me of Jamaica's evolution and growth in, in that regard mm. is the difference in responses that I've started to get from people mm. when I invite them not only to Jamaica mm. but to Kingston of all places okay when we started out we weren't actually trying to pitch Kingston we were telling people to come to the tourism locations because yeah. Kingston, even even worse, had a bad reputation. Okay. Right? And the responses so how did you that change we were, that reputation. What well, happened? Well, I'll say this: you know, the responses that we were getting, mm. it's it's kind of funny that it's changed because they used to be so deliberate, right? It's like you invite a guy to Jamaica, and his response is, you know, hey, Kirk Anthony, thank you very much. However, I wouldn't come to Jamaica basically. I'd be concerned about my safety, etc., mm. etc. Nowadays, people just tell us yes or no. I can make it, I yeah. can't make it, yeah. right? Um, how do you change that? I mean, it's not a story of Kirk by himself, by any means. Um, I think, you know, a tide just started to shift in Jamaica. I think we were a part of doing it. Yeah. But the shift started to happen where 
people started to realize that we have to mm. embrace more value in somewhere like Kingston than we're currently doing, right? And that means pumping money in from central government? That or means, does that mean entrepreneurs basically? I think multiple there? things, right? Yeah. It, it means people talk nicer about it, right? Mm -hmm. It means people see a possibility of or a hope of doing something there that, that mm -hmm. they probably never envisioned before, mm -hmm. right? Um, it means government trying to showcase parts of it that, that you never knew. Like mm -hmm. what I guess I, I would say is probably one of the drivers is when you start looking for growth, yeah. oftentimes we end up looking in new places, mm -hmm. right? So imagine Montego Bay is the tourism capital of Jamaica. It okay. feeds into places like Negril and Ocho Rios. Okay. If, if you start to feel like, you know what, these places are hitting some level of a plateau, mm -hmm. right? You start saying, okay, what's, what's untouched? you know mm -hmm. and so then you start looking at you know Kingston has a national airport international yeah. airport um, and and what we're now seeing happening in Jamaica is that there are places like Portland Port Antonio which is mm -hmm. our untouched okay. um, yeah, parish yeah. right beautiful prettiest place in Jamaica yeah, yeah, yeah. right okay they're it's now rich. finally building a highway to port to Portland and Port Antonio mm -hmm. and again it's a, it's a concept that I'm mentioning right over time if you're if you're in growth mode you're gonna have to look elsewhere yeah. so you start looking at these places now and you say okay we can start to focus yeah. some people going there yeah. right and, and we weren't what I think you also realize is mm. how much potential has not been leveraged in a place mm. and, and mm. that I would say is Kingston altogether because Kingston okay. to me is an amazing city um, totally under time yeah yeah now I appreciate you sharing that story and um, I think one thing that uh, to, to kind of close, one thing that people would I think love to know is just kind of how you've kept going and where where do you see yourself going to next? Um, you know, you've already built yourself uh, a strong reputation. You know, you've delivered so much for the, the region. Um, as I said, you're the most connected uh, person here. Um, for people who are watching, who are trying to figure out what kind of social change they want to make, mm -hmm. um, do you have any advice for them, um, given all your experience and also kind of uh, maybe what they should be thinking about in terms of having an impact on? That's two questions. It is, it is. <laughs> um, I tried um, to put in two. No, no problem. To so to answer number time. one, where, where I slash me in terms of my collective, um, and, and the reason I say it that way is I have different business partners in, in different areas, but we're all like minds trying to pursue this thing, um, is a shift away from, you know, we've been building platforms and communities, mm -hmm now we're heading to the space of implementation because a lot of what we drive are new ideas um, that require new skill sets and such like that that mm -hmm. you know may not be as um, proliferated in the in the region right mm -hmm. so sometimes you you realize or i think we've come to the realization in some instances where we have to put the ideas into play that we think are going to work in the market okay right and so what that looks like is we've become our you know investors mm -hmm. we um, support other people in trying to take their ideas from zero to something mm. um, most times we're working with established players right so you know we'll end up engaging in some level of equity for for what we bring and, and such like that um, in terms of those who are starting out and trying to to build somewhere um, you know advice wise my, my greatest advice to any entrepreneur is always just get started right mm -hmm. people build up and, and the older you get is the easier this becomes to, to do to yourself when we go through life's experiences we learn what the challenges look like and we're able to sell ourselves all the reason why something all the reasons why something cannot work um, so I always say to people when they when they sell me their ideas and then they tell me you know I'm gonna do this next year or two years from now I always give them one little piece of advice, which is just look, somehow, some way, mm. no matter how small, mm. just start some part of it. You know what I mean? Mm. You're telling me you're going to invest next year, open an account and invest $100, right? You're telling me you're going to open this business that does XYZ, try and, you know, make the cookie or whatever it is mm. you're going to sell and, and sell too, right? Mm. Start to learn what entrepreneurship is yeah. because it, it really isn't easy mm. and you don't I don't think you reach that place where everything is done and so you know polished mm. 
that you know you get to leave the job with nothing to worry about right i think that's a dream that a lot of people have that i'm going to you know pursue this work that i'm doing in a job and i'm going to get to a place where somehow on the side i've managed to build this thing and an investor is going to come in and they're going to pave this gold road for me mm-hmm. right and the reality is you may find the investor mm. but what you then learn is once you have investors the story and the journey only now starts right mm. so it's it's they're not coming in to pave a gold uh, gold, gold paved road for you by any means yeah. and you know you then have a lot of work to do so the important thing is just to start where you are and I think a lot of people try to start at the end instead of the beginning mm-hmm. focus on ensuring that you understand what the beginning of what you're trying to achieve looks like and work on those parts mm. don't try to be what you know you know your dream is 10 years from now focus on where you are you take the vision is, is what um, Hamdi Ulakaya, the founder of Chabani said to me years ago actually in 2014 I think it was okay. said to me in Morocco right uh, fortunate to meet him there and he said this thing about you know Kirk you take the vision mm. and you take it from here and you put it up here because you know this is where you're trying to go and then you build a ladder Mm-hmm. and you start pursuing it right but you have mm-hmm. to start with where you are mm-hmm. you, you can't start where you're trying to be yeah 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 i love that um listen i'm so glad that in 2016 we we met um uh, through the world economic forum annual meeting you know who would have known six years later we'd be here having this conversation and spending a month here in, in bermuda on this residential um I already have seen you climb this ladder towards this bit here from your vision to, to where you're bringing it and it's been a joy and amazing to see you in action in, in, in your home region. So appreciate that. Thanks for your leadership. Thanks for your inspiration. Thanks for your time. And uh, I'm sure lots of people would have learned so much from your story. So thank you, uh, Kirk. Thank you for asking me to do this. I, I definitely am honored. Cheers, man. Thank you so much to all of you who have become monthly supporters of the School of Social Justice. Your monthly contributions make a huge difference and allow us to deliver our content, which is educational and teaches people how to make a difference. If you want to become a patron as well, it's really simple. All you've got to do is go to the schoolofsocialjustice.com website, then click supporters, and choose how much you want to contribute, whether it be £20 a month, a fiver a month, or a tenner a month. Let's go with a tenner a month. It's really simple. Put in your details, put in your card number, click pay now, and you become a supporter. Uh, Whilst five pounds a month is not much individually, it makes a huge difference collectively. And if we get 2,000 patrons, we can independently deliver content to you every single week to help ensure that we fulfill this mission of training the next generation of Martin Luther Kings. Thank you so much to all of you who've become patrons so far. You've made a huge difference and allowed us to continue with our work. And if you do become a patron, thank you so much. Your support means a lot. Take care. Bye.